The Devil and Us, a memoir of you and me. Everything you think you know about evil is wrong. Good evening, folks. It's uh, Friday, the 12th of April, 1056 Mountain Time, PM. I'm Bruce McDonald, and this is the Telemanca Review, and we're going to keep going with um, the devil and the description of the devil. Now, I should be very candid about the fact that I had a significant amount of assistance in writing this book. It's difficult to sometimes be honest about how these things come about because it's just a reality most people are not accustomed to. So we're in a time now where I think it's just important to put everything out there. So I had a tremendous amount of assistance uh, from a friend of mine um, and some other contribution from people who have met the devil. And the devil is an entity that can be met. It can be manifested and you can interact with it. This may seem to contradict part one of this series on the devil, which is chapter four in the book, The Devil and Us, A Memoir of You and Me. Um, but it is not. It, it, it has to have a way for us to interact with it, right? Just like a, a monitor and a keyboard is the way we interact with a computer. The devil has a visage. The devil has a personage. The devil can assume a, uh, almost any persona it wants, actually, or util utilize a living human being not in full capacity and use that as a presentation vehicle. Okay, so let's get back to this. So where we left off was that the devil is, in fact, a divine being. And I gave the example of the Hindu scripture about uh, the singularity of Brahman and then the uh, creator and the destroyer. The creator is uh, Vishnu and Shiva is the destroyer. Now in the West, we've made these two entities antagonistic. They're not antagonistic in the other theologies, okay? And most of the Eastern theologies, they have a negative principality, but it's, it's not quite like ours. And it's the same thing with... Um, uh, native mythologies and native spirituality. There are characters of negativity, but they're, they're not really negative in the way that we perceive the devil. The devil is a unique construct. In the original Judaica, um, it, it didn't mean what Christians are making it out to mean now. This concept of the devil, as we understand it today, is the very height of spiritual ignorance the absolute height of spiritual ignorance. It creates fear, it creates tension, and it creates a people that are much more willing to do insane things. Because when you contemplate this topic in and of itself, and when you allow yourself to believe it, you enter into a kind of very dangerous place for a human being, a place of intense um, passion, let's say. Well, we see it on full view now in the Middle East, do we not? You know, there's really no solution to that problem. That is a an absolute lesson in the devil at work, okay? The devil is the energy I've been trying to describe to you. Now, very often, when we find ourselves in an absolute position, we end up very much inviting these negative forces because the job of the negative force is to move you from a position of absolutism. Okay, because life is not absolute, it's fluid, it's constantly fluid, it's one moment to the next, every moment has to be lived. When you fix yourself in an absolutism, and here I'm referring, of course, to dogma, the dogma of the Abrahamic religions, and so you've got the chosen people, and then you've got the uh, last pro alleged last prophet in the Abrahamic tradition being Muhammad, no disrespect upon him, no re disrespect upon Yeshua. And um, no disrespect upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, the teachings are actually quite good. I think that the fault lies, I mean, the source material is good. The way it's being brought to the public now and the people who are handling it, and I suspect their motivation for even becoming preachers in most instances, is um, power-based. And so the devil became a way to keep people in the pews. The devil became a way to rationalize a lot of the excesses of the Vatican, a lot of excesses of um, the Inquisition and the control. And it's a fear mechanism, okay? 
Now, as I go through these things, keep in mind that in my own life journey, I've gone through some intense uh, spiritual attacks from other dimensions, not the devil. OK, the worst one I document in this book after a year of um, dancing every Saturday night and singing the sacred Arabic prayers of the Sufis with my son and I, which we did for a year, enjoyed thoroughly. Very enriching prayer, by the way. Um, the Sufi zikr is an incredible prayer, one of the most advanced uh, forms of worship I've ever participated in in my life. And um, when asked to convert after a year, I said no. And I spoke for my son, who was about 12 years old at the time, and we left the Durga. And slightly after that, I was just went through about six weeks of um, what many might call demonic attack. I mean, it, it, it was physical. I was being poked at night, okay? Very similar almost to um, the stories you hear about the abductions, okay? Something was trying to pull me out of my body. You know, it was a very, very fascinating experience, the, the whole thing. Now, I don't know what it is about me, but I never really get scared. I am, you know, the hair can go up on the back of my neck, um, all of the basic sort of um, accoutrements of survival and common sense are present in me. Um, but I, I just, I don't get freaked out about things. I've had so many experiences in my life negative and positive that are multidimensional that nothing really bothers me and if you live a certain way and your it, your intent is pure if your intent is always to go back to the source of life in your consciousness then most things are going to leave you alone because that's a sacred mission and most things don't interfere with sacred missions or sacred things okay it's done quietly it's done without dogma and it's done through the the spiritual exercises that work best for you and there's no one spiritual exercise that is best. For some people, prayer is good. For some people, meditation is good. For some people, singing is good. For some people, fasting is good. Well, fasting, I think, is universally good for human health. So I'll leave that off the list. But the point I'm making is, is, is if there's anybody out there listening to me thinking that I'm wrong because they've had personal experiences with negative entities that are non-physical, remember it's you defined it as the devil or an aspect of the devil, okay? The truth is there's life everywhere. It's not just, and I mean sentient life, like comparable to human beings, able, able to individuate itself, knows what it is, knows its name, knows its existence, okay? Many, many, many forms of life beyond the, the angelic orders given to us in the Abrahamic scriptures, uh, beyond even what the extraterrestrial movement is talking about. There's there's life right on this planet that uh, is non-human. And it's always been here with us. We never see it, okay? How do I know these things? I just do, okay? Anybody can know these things if you really want to know them. In many instances, it might be just a byproduct of your spiritual practice, and if that's the case, generally, you'll get one or two experiences with something and you'll move on. The trick is never to get hung up on anything, never to get overly invested in one thing and never detour from your goal. And your goal should always be to go back to the source of life. OK, I call it the ocean of love and mercy in deference to Kabir, who is my favorite uh, spiritual teacher. OK, he lived about 500 years ago. And he was born up around what is now the um, India-Pakistan border. And he greatly influenced the spiritual culture up there, in tremendously so, okay? Influenced Sikhism, uh, influenced Sant Mat, influenced Sufism, and uh, other paths as well. He was an extraordinary human being. And this is another thing, when you study many religions... Um, you realize that, you know, God or the creator has sent many, many teachers down here and no people, any, when a culture gets to the point that it believes it is the sole proprietor of the truth of the universe and everything that God wants because of what a teacher told them, that culture is in trouble. And we're witnessing it now in the Middle East. It's, it's the conflict of two absolutes that have absolutely no resolution. Okay. I don't take a side because they're both lying to us. If they want us to, 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 to feel bad 
about their dead children and their dead family members and their blown up uh, synagogues and mosques, then at least be reasonable. Provide a third party observer a reasonable input into the situation. How do we make reasonable input to a situation where basically the two positions are, we're God's chosen people and we're eventually going to blow up the Alaska mosque. We're already doing the red heifer sacrifice, which is the antecedent to the third temple. And um, pretend you're not doing that and, and tell the Arab world and the support of Christian world, which is, I think, by and large favors Israel because it's a cosmopolitan nation that thinks and acts like us in many ways, uh, you know. So we, we sort of lean toward that, at least in our media. Now, that there's a whole other topic there. I don't want to get into it. That's the province of other podcasters, okay? But you know what I'm talking about. Now that may in in it, these things I'm saying about the disingenuous position of Israel may engender some sympathy for you in the Palestinians. Now let's take a look at them. Hamas wrote in its charter that they want to destroy Israel and kill every Jew in the world. Not really a people. Basically, they've put down on paper that we'll, we'll never negotiate with these people. There are existential and mortal enemies and no peace can ever be had. So you've got the chosen people versus the people who think they're the new chosen people, and they're going to battle it out to the death. You know, where does a third party step into that? How does a third party step into that? And how did two cultures get to this position where they're so far gone, so far gone in their interpretation of what's going on in this reality, in this life? Well, one of the reasons is a lot of religions will give you low-level spiritual experiences. You'll have an astral experience. Very often, that's the very first experience. You'll have an astral experience. And what people do, and this is a common mistake, is they attribute the religion or the teachings they're following to the experience. The experience is yours, okay? So if, if, if you're taught how to pray and you pray for, diligently for six months... And a supernatural experience happens to you, like you you have a dream with a dead relative who tells you where, um, you know, something you misplaced is, and you wake up the next day and you go and you look in that place and it's there. You go, ah, oh, inshallah, God is real, you know, or wh wh whatever the Hebrew version is, of that is. But that's just you. You understand? It's just it's got nothing to do with the religion. Now, if you want to be a part of a religion to form society and community and, and create a building block out of that, so be it. I mean, what's wrong with that? All, all the power to you. But when it gets to this point where it's just, you know, two forms of absolutism locked in an eternal struggle until one side is completely destroyed. It's, by the way, that's the only solution to this problem. Okay. One side has to completely destroy the other. Okay. Now, how would that look? Well, either either Israel is wiped off the map and the six or seven million Jews living there are killed, which would be a tragedy for the human race. Or somehow, which seems like a military impossibility, Israel is able to kill 1.5 billion Muslims, okay? Because it's not just the Palestinians. That will, even if, even if the Israelis destroy everything that has to do with um, Arabic culture in Gaza and takes it over completely, they will have the rest of the Arab world to deal with, okay? It seems to me, and I'll say this, uh, you know, I've, I, I've, I, I've said true and accurate things about both sides, okay? And I'll just close with this. It's been my experience that Arabs are predisposed to fighting. Okay. Now, if you leave them alone, brother will fight brother, cousin will fight cousin. If you give them an enemy outside of that nuclear family or outside of the interior life of their own religion and culture, they all unify and they will attack that one thing because the peace they have found in not fighting each other is only possible when they have something that's not them to fight. Now, ask yourself, why is a religious culture fighting so much? Why are they always fighting? Isn't religion supposed to instill in someone 
transcendence, union, peace, clarity, vision, but apparently not, right? At least the way religion is taught now in that part of the world. But this segment is on the devil. I'm getting off track here, okay? So the devil is not a violator, okay? Never breaks the law. This this is very important to understand that the the devil never ever breaks the law. Okay? So you know, if you if you have some idea in your head that the devil is somehow breaking divine cosmic law. Now, what is what is divine cosmic law? Some people call it natural law. Uh, what is this, okay? Well, it's a set of laws that are, some of them are readily apprehendable to everybody. Like gravity is one. That's a natural law. You can't float away. You know, you're, you're, you're bound to the ground. Your feet are always going to be walking in, on the ground. Okay. So that's a natural law. The seasons are a natural law. Um, what is then a, 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 an example of natural law that is beyond our ability to easily apprehend with our eyes and with our mind well they get they get a little bit deeper okay so <clears throat> for instance the law of re reciprocity okay the law the the is often referred to as the law of karma so that which you put out is going to come back to you okay that one's a little bit harder to readily apprehend by people be because sometimes the time between the act and the reaction is so great that any possible connection is lost, okay? Sometimes it can be several lifetimes before you pay for an action that you commit. So how do you make the connection between action and reaction? It's very difficult. Therefore, how do you prove the law of karma? How do you prove the law of re reciprocity? Well, I mean, it's, 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 got a, um, it's got a scientific correlate. I mean, Newton was able to prove it with calculus. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, okay? So it's just the fabric in which we live. But realize when Newton said that, he was talking about the physical world. But that law actually goes into your feeling, your thoughts as well. So for every thought, there's an equal and opposite thought. Maybe conscious, maybe unconscious. Okay? So if you spend your entire life dedicated to the idea of purity, I absolutely promise you impurity will come into your life. Okay, you look at, take take my birth religion, Catholicism, for an example. Now, this is supposed to be the, the, relig the true religion of Christ, who was the Prince of Peace, who rather than hurt anyone would give up his own life. Okay, he became the Lamb of the world, according to the story. When you look at Catholic culture, it's got to be one of the most um, violent cultures on the planet. You know, what are you talking about, Bruce? Well, I'm talking about, like, look at your movies, okay? South Boston, Irish Catholic gangsters. The Italians, gangsters, okay? Why is it that all these cultures produce these societies of absolute wickedness and power by violence, okay? Because it's the unconscious part of your desire. Because when you ask for something in this reality, you get the totality of it. You get the you get the light and the dark side of the moon. You don't realize you're asking for the dark side when you ask for the light side, but this is the way wish fulfillment or manifestation works. You get the whole of it. So be careful what you ask for, you know? All right, so devil's not a violator, never breaks the law. So. This means that every single time you find the devil in your life, you invited him in, okay? Think clearly, and you'll see all the times you invited the devil. And it's also part of the system and the law. You can ask for this information. The devil is responsible for this disclosure. Now, if he fails upon request, all contracts affected by the disclosure are presumed void. Okay, so the devil or this energy that we call that uh, that I say this energy field that represents the devil operates very, very much like a lawyer, which, by the way, in the original Hebrew, Satan, Satan, I think it's pronounced Shetan, similar to the to the um, Arabic um, 
way they say it. They say shatan, but I forget what it is in the original Hebrew, but it's a lawyer. Okay. So it's he who interprets the law. Okay. What is the law? How is it to be interpreted? Now, the law is self-fulfilling. It doesn't need human agency. Okay. Now, that may sound anarchistic, but the anarchists are closer to the spiritual truth of how to live on this planet than most people, than I'd say almost everybody. Anarchy is not what you think it is. Now, I myself would not define myself as an anarchist. I would define myself as nothing, just a living being seeking the highest possible experience within this lifetime, the highest possible experience of awareness, love, presence, being, truth, knowledge, insight, and understanding. That's my life goal. It's very, very, very consistent in that. It's been well over 40 years that I've been involved in this pursuit. Okay, so you can ask the devil for the information. He has to give it to you. The, the devil is actually one of the greatest teachers on the planet. In fact, that's his principal role is teaching. But he doesn't teach in a way that you think he teaches. He teaches by he he teaches by ensuring that you receive the consequence to your action. Okay? Now, you may be provoked by the devil or one of its agents in the negative pantheon to do something. Okay? You say, "Well, the devil tempted me to do it." Well, you did it, meaning you wanted the experience, okay? If you were susceptible to the temptation, it means part of you wanted it and you did it. Okay, so you have to assume all liability for your actions. This is a universal truth in all religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. I mean, they have forgiveness in Christianity, which I think is a, a little ridiculous. You know, they're, they, you know that some dude who went to seminary can forgive you of your sins as a representative of God, as an emissary of Christ. I mean, why did we commodify that? You ever notice the similarities between a confessional and a drive through at McDonald's? It's a commodification of the concept, okay? And that's what it is. They they incorporated Christ. It's, it's vulgar and it's disgusting, okay? Nobody can forgive you of your sins. You can only forgive yourself, okay? And sometimes to do that, you have to go on a great journey. You have to manifest a catharsis that will allow you to forgive yourself, okay? Great example comes to mind is a 1980-something movie called The Mission with Jeremy Irons and Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro begins as a slave trader working for the Portuguese about 400 years ago, accidentally or in a fit of passion, kills his brother who is bedding his woman and goes mad as a result and refuses to eat and ends up in a... Um, quarantine at um, a jail somewhere and wants to die, wants to be executed. The Jesuits approach him and ask him if he wants an opportunity to redeem himself. And he said, there's nothing in the world that could possibly redeem me. I killed my brother. And they take him on this epic journey to South America, to the Brazilian rainforests. He becomes a Jesuit. He, he studies, takes his oaths. It's a remarkable movie. I highly recommend that you take a look at it if you have not already. But he needed to go through all of that to forgive himself, okay? So we see oftentimes in the behavior of people the equitable nature of action and reaction. We understand we owe something and we want to pay it back. Well, what are we paying back? You, he, can't bring his, he can't bring his brother back. So what is he possibly going to pay back? He somehow has to pay life back. He took life. He took his brother. He has to pay life back. Life is a metaphor for God or an allegory for God or an analogy for God. Okay? He has to pay back the living. And if he can't pay it back, he can't live in the world. His heart won't let him. Okay? Okay. It's a lawful system we live in. Okay, it's just that people don't understand the law, it, but it is a lawful system. We've always had law. There's very little interpretation in the law. 
interpretation in the law is more for courts, um, lawyers, television, and movies. In the real law, there's very little interpretation. It's, it's mathematically precise. Okay? Now, again, there was no fall from heaven. Okay? It's a fairy tale. It's nonsense. There was no fall from heaven. Okay? There's no original sin. Okay? This is just the reality of the evolutionary process spiritually on this planet. Okay? All that stuff you've been told is complete and utter nonsense. No fall from heaven. Okay? There was no rebellion. The devil has always been here and will always be here. He, he that energy, that, that personage as it manifests, is required to maintain this reality at the physical level. Okay? It's a feature of this reality. We tell ourselves these stories to understand things. That's it. But they just end up confusing things over time. Devil doesn't break any law. He's not above the law. We understand from this observation that the devil is not corrupt. Okay? Cannot be corrupt. There's no way he could do his job if he was corrupt. He's the perfect example of the law. We accept the invitation for power and control over institutions and people. We become bound to the law of the devil when we want part of the devil's power which is control over everything in this dimension. Okay? The law is intended to maintain the peace because peace is the agreed-upon commonality of the human experience at times. But as human beings, we like to create drama, and then when it gets to be too much, we say peace. But we create the drama and then cry for peace. Okay? It's like a child saying it wants to go into the forest with its friends and the mother says, well, you're, you're still a bit young to go into the forest alone. Well, I really want to go in. They go in and, you know, get lost and people have got to go in there and find them before the sun goes down. And when you get them, they're terrified. And why did I go into the forest? That's, a, that's an apt analogy, I think, for the devil. Okay? When... The law comes into effect, we often hear an internal voice, or what we might call internal chatter. That's the devil. Okay? He's built right into us. He has a say on what we feel, what we experience, and what we remember. He's an equitable partner. You hear, the, you hear other opinions, but they're just ignorant. Some will tell you the devil is evil. I say no. It's not evil. No such thing as evil. The only evil in this world is the disharmony with the creative process human beings bring into their existence. Nothing else does this. Everything else operates within its natural parameters. Man is an inherently supernatural creature because we have the ability to act against natural law. We have the ability to do irrational things. Okay? Nothing else in nature does this. Just us. Okay? So when we have the devil in us, we start to get a chatter in our head, okay? Start to get a chatter in the head. And that's the devil built right into us. Devil has a job to do, and it has to be respected, okay? Has to be respected. The law is simple. If you play with the energy, you entrap yourself in a myriad of chattering invitations. The moment you listen to the chatter, it gets louder. Once the chattering becomes a chorus, the power of the devil is all about you and all through you. All of the invitations given to you will be invitations into darkness. Okay? The dark is very seductive. Everybody wants to go into the dark. It's irresistible. The further you go into the darkness, the darker you become. It's subtle at first. You don't even notice it, but it becomes more distinct. And then one day without knowing when it started, 
the chatter's turned into a conversation. Now the devil speaks to you. Do you know why? Because you've gone so far into the darkness, you can't find your way out. The first thing the devil does is blind you. The way you that way you can't go anywhere without holding his hand. And once you take his hand, then the chatter turns into a conversation. Then you realize what's going on, but it's too late. Too late. And you cannot have these things lifted from you. Okay? I suppose in rare instances it's possible for somebody to, to lift it for you, but it would have to be a very evolved spiritual being. Okay? Not a run-of-the-mill minister or priest or rabbi or a mom or anything like that. It would it would have to be somebody with real spiritual power. Okay? And they probably even wouldn't do it because if they had that kind of spiritual consciousness, they would recognize that you created this experience for yourself and realize that helping you at this point, even though you're asking for it, is a violation of your own free will because you brought the experience into your life. Why should anybody else help you out? Okay? You know? What would you do? I mean, if you, if if uh, your husband or wife went and bought a car, had it for two days and said, I don't like this car, I want to get rid of it, give me my money back, you think the dealer is going to give you your money back? Transactions finished. Sell it. You're going to lose about 25 30%. It loses 33% of its value the moment you drive it off the lot, or it used to in a standard market 20, 30 years ago. But you've lost money because it's no longer a new car. And you bought it, right? Same thing applies. You know, there's an absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant passage in a Ridley Scott film called The Counselor. In fact, I'm going to play it now. I play this quite a bit, actually. I used to play it quite a bit on one of my shows. So you see, the world you live in is no longer the world in which you made the decision. The decision changed the world. It changed your direction in life. You cannot go back to the world that existed when you made the decision. Okay? You can't. This was the genius of Cormac McCarthy, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, and my favorite writer, okay? Absolutely my favorite writer. I don't even have a close second. It's just Cormac McCarthy all the way, okay? If you haven't read him, you absolutely should read Cormac McCarthy, okay? So, yeah. Now, once you're in conversation with the devil and he's holding your hand, if you keep going into the darkness from this point, you'll self-destruct. You activate the death wish within yourself. Okay? We all have it. It's built into the body. It's a destroyer of sorts. Our own personal Shiva. The moment God invented time, destruction had to follow. Because the only thing that denotes time is entropy. Entropy is the decay and dissolution of things. Okay? So time is measured by death. If nothing, die, if nothing died, we would never think about time. Okay? There would be nowhere to be. There would be no schedule. There would be no perfect decade to start your family. Because there's no time. Right? So time is the fulcrum for the devil's world, which is the world we live in. And it is the devil's world. Okay? This is explained by Christ. You know, the devil runs everything down here, okay? Now, what he said and the way it's been interpreted is, if I say it's abysmal, it suggests a lack of comprehension and ignorance, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think the people doing it actually know the truth and use this paradigm, use this construct, construct as a control mechanism to control people's thoughts and feelings and behavior. This is what I think, okay? I think it's all conscious, at the top anyways, at the very top. Time is a lie. Absolutely, time is a lie. Always has been. The only concept of time we have is from our physical bodies, okay? They fall down. After time, they wither and they fall. Our cells can't continue to reproduce. 
You know, it fascinates me that science and, you know, occasionally you see a news story about, you know, gene therapy, medical advances may create a circumstance where we live nearly forever in the future. I think living forever in a body would be a kind of a hell. Okay, I think we come into body to get certain things done. And when within, within the time frame of a life, it's an acceptable experience. But I think if you had to be in the body forever, you'd go crazy. I don't think I I can't ever imagine a time where I'd want to be alive forever. I might want a little boost, maybe a 200 year life. You know, I think that might be a bit more productive, 400, 800 year life. You could really master a number of things in a in a two or a 300 year life. Think of all the things you could master. You know, there's a lot to do there. But if you weren't disciplined and you didn't know why you were alive, why would you want a life that long? Most people don't even want the 80, 85 years of the present lifespan. You know, most people commit some form of passive suicide to not reach that expectation. The present physical form we have was geared for a life of 125 years. These bodies we're in were built to last 125 years. But the way we live, you're, you're lucky if you get 80 or 85. Okay. So this destruction is built right into us. It's built into the body. It's built into everything in the natural environment. I mean, some things go a long time. You know, there's consciousness in, in the minerals. So the old, the, 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 the greatest longevity for a spiritually animated thing on the planet is at the mineral level, because you could stay in mineral level for millions of years before some form of erosion would dissolve that. Okay, think about that. Another great poet, British poet laureate, died in 1998, Ted Hughes. Some of you might know him as being married to Sylvia Plath, who committed suicide, but that's an unfortunate affectation and stain upon a, his reputation as a poet. But absolutely brilliant poet. He had this one line in one of his poems one time. A pebble is imprisoned like nothing else in this universe. Right? Somehow he figured it out as well. In uh, ancient times, all peoples understood that there were male and female stones. There was gender in stones. Okay? What we knew in the past, in the golden age, we knew how to live here. What happens through our behavior, and this is the explanation for the yugas, and the, 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 the yugas are the delimitation of the ent entropy of the system itself right down from the creator to all dimensions of the creation. Um, so this entropy comes about, uh, I think, in large measure because of our behavior. And so things are taken away from us, right? Okay. They're taken away from us. So the gifts were given in the golden age are slowly whittled away. And we come, when we come to the dark age before a reset, you're dealing with a human race that is just, you know, insane, absolutely insane, you know, mutilating itself, killing itself. Look, look, look at the world you live in right now. Look at um, the de facto drug free zones in Vancouver and Portland and New York. Okay. And you tell me people aren't killing themselves. Why are they killing themselves? Why would anybody kill themselves? Okay. I suppose depression, sadness, loss of a loved one, an incredible grief you can't get over. But, you know, I still don't get it. I still don't understand why people do it, right? Do not have any idea of how people do it. So we are permanent and we are eternal. Our true being is permanent and eternal. And therefore, a person who gains spiritual insight does not become preoccupied with or view the world solely through the perspective of the flesh, which is impermanent and laced with fear. The consciousness that lives through the flesh is constantly living in fear because the flesh dies. And if that's all you believe you are, then you believe you're going to die. You're going to cease to exist. But it's not the case. You're an eternal being. You can't die. Okay, you can't die. Put yourself into some pretty negative states here and on the other side. Some of those negative states on the other side can go on for quite a long time. 
But when you understand the system we're living in, you come to understand that they're all fundamentally voluntary. You, you put yourself into those situations. You and nobody else but you. Okay? All right. Well, that's the devil part two. I'll do another part fairly soon. I'm Bruce McDonald, and this has been the Talamanca Review.